started. My watch says there's a minute left. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Linzer. I am a faculty member and professor here at the Whitney Lab. I have been here for 35 years. And, and I'm not dead yet. Um, for 20 of those 35 years, the, the most recent 20 years, I have, among other things, my laboratory group, which is now down to me, um, but at times was up to as many as 15 people, have worked on the fundamental biology of mosquitoes from a very sort of basic science perspective using the modern techniques of molecular biology. And we're not going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about things that relate to something that happened to me because of the research that we were doing. That is, I was appointed to the Florida Coordinating Council for, for Mosquito Control, so the FCMC. FCCMC, there you go. And in that other avocation in my life, um, I am very much involved with the communications between all of the mosquito control districts and the mosquito control personnel and the state of Florida and Tallahassee. And so what I'm going to present tonight is going to be more related to the big picture in the country and, and the state of Florida. But before I get into that, I would like to point out that um, as currently I am sort of in charge of the evenings at the Whitney Lecture Series, I would like to invite you all to come back on December 14th for our next edition, who will, which will uh, feature Pam Soltis, who she will rock your, your, your world. She will give you uh, a very interesting set of insights into your world. She's an outstanding speaker and an amazing scientist. So please come back on December 14th. Okay, so Dan, now let's switch over to, there we go, that, that looks like it. I didn't bring glasses with me up here. I really can't see this thing. Oh, where's that little icon? Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. I see it, the little, ah, ta-da. Anyway, so what we're going to talk about tonight is a number of topics that have to do with mosquitoes and the threat that they represent to our lives and the evolving technologies that are always being developed around us to try and deal with what they represent to us. So there's the title. You saw the title probably before you came tonight. And I have a little bit of an outline. So we're going to start out with some little bit of fun information about mosquitoes that most of you will already know some of that. But you know, one of the things that's really topical in the media right now is how do you be happy? Well, one of the things on that list of being happy that, that people who live in Denmark, which is the happiest country in the world, is that every day you should learn something. And I'm hoping that tonight you'll learn something. I learned some stuff today that I'm dealing with. <laughs> but in any event, it has to do with science. But in, in any event, hopefully you'll learn something today from the fun facts and from the insights into how mosquito control is being handled in the state of Florida at the moment and the area right around here. So we'll have some fun facts. We'll talk about biology. And one of my favorite topics is evolution, the forces that drive evolution, because it is very pertinent to the control of mosquitoes, because mosquitoes exist in very large numbers. And when any organism exists in very large numbers, the opportunity for selection for characteristics that thwart your efforts to get rid of them is very high and very likely. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the pathogen issues that we're all concerned with, specifically Zika, chikungunya, dengue, on and on and on. The list is actually larger than you might think, but the ones that we're really concerned with right now. And then I will tell you a little bit about some of the developing technologies that go over and above or beyond, or however you want to look at it, uh, just the development of more pesticides. You know, we'd all like to actually, my position on the Florida Coordinating Council is as an environmentalist, and it is my job to watch and to make sure that we don't lose sight of the rest of the environment in controlling mosquitoes. So here's fun fact number one. So mosquitoes are vampires. Female mosquitoes are vampires. We'll come back to that issue again. But mosquitoes, for the purpose of laying eggs, they some, most mosquito species require a meal of blood. And this has evolved many different times in the evolution of arthropods. So all the animals that have exoskeletons, 
There are 21 different black dots up there. You'll know some of them, some of them you won't know. You certainly know chiggers. We all, everybody who lives in Florida hates freaking chiggers. I hate chiggers. They keep me out of the jungle in the summer. Chiggers, ticks are down here. We all know ticks, we hate ticks. But there's actually a number of, there's 21 different arguments that you can make that the, the propensity to take a blood meal has evolved. And what that does and what comes along with that is the possibility of taking two blood meals and transferring a disease from the first individual, whether it be a snake or a fish or a, a monkey or a human being, and then the second time that that organism takes a blood meal, transferring a disease organism through that hematophagy. That's one of our favorite science words, hematophagy, which means taking a blood meal. And in fact, in, in a number of these organisms, there are disease organisms that can be transferred that way. But it is a very complex arrangement to be able to do that. And it's highly evolved, and I'll come back to that. Suffice it to say that this has happened a lot of times. Mosquitoes are down here. The Culicidae, Culicidae. There are other things. There's even a butterfly up here in Malaysia that will sit on your face when you're asleep and take a bite and suck some blood. So it's, it's an opportunistic way of getting a high energy meal. Most of these organisms' ancestors got their energy from some plant source. But somewhere along the line, pressures allowed for them to evolve that capacity to take blood meal and, that, and to use that opportunity, which is a very rich source of biological energy, to produce the next generation. So if you look at the big picture for mosquitoes, there's over 3,000 species worldwide. They've been around a very long time. They've been around, and I'll show you some, some pretty pictures of that. This, this is what's called a phylogram, and the mosquitoes are up here, and they have been around for certainly hundreds of millions of years. We've only been around for a couple hundred thousand, you know, in our lineage, maybe a million or two million. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years. So they've had a lot of time to diversify into 3,000 3, different species, at least, and to evolve relationship, relationships with disease organisms as well. They have a bipartite life cycle. So there's really two very, very distinct forms in their life. There's the, the mosquito that you swat, which flies. So it's an airborne thing, flies around. And then the majority of mosquitoes on planet Earth at any given time are young mosquitoes, larval mosquitoes, and they swim. They are, they are required, they're obligate aquatic organisms. So this, how that evolved is also in itself a, you know, a subject matter of its own and intrigues the heck out of me, but it did evolve. Early on, 150 years ago, people assumed that when we finally could understand the genetics of these guys and these guys, we would find that they actually really had two genomes and they were kind of merged, two different animals that somehow got together. That turns out not to be the case at all. The genes that, that drive larval development and the life, larval life cycle are in common with most of the genes of the adult as well. And it's all in the regulation of when and where and how things are turned off and on. So I already mentioned, you probably already knew, that only females bite. You can tell the difference. This is one of the mosquitoes that is a problem for us here in this area. This is the Asian tiger mosquito, or Aedes albopictus. And the female is on the left, and she's taking a blood meal from, could even be my arm, but it isn't, and the male is on the right. And they're, they're morphologically similar but different. She's bigger, he's smaller, and he has a, a very well-developed chemosensory apparatus. You can call it a nose if you like. And the, the, the reason that his nose is so elaborate compared to her nose is he has to find her. And she doesn't smell that much, but she smells a little bit. And these, this organ, the, the olfactory organ in mosquitoes, male mosquitoes, is fine-tuned to finding specific pheromone signals from females of, the own of their own species. And so when mosquitoes mate, and they'll mate any time that they can, 
they, they have to find each other. And one of the ways that the male finds the female is through pheromones. And so they have very well developed, there's a lot of science involved in understanding how that works. Females, as you probably are already aware, they can find you because you breathe out CO2. So they have receptors that are involved in localizing on a CO2 source. Um, if you could stop breathing, they probably wouldn't find you. But that's a, a fairly long distance uh, sensory signal. They'll get, you know, 10 feet away from you and the CO2 no longer is what they're homing in on. Then they smell your feet or whatever. They smell specifics and that's an, another area of very well, de, de, uh, of sci well developed science. There's this famous picture from the cover of a science magazine of a mosquito on a block of Limburger trying to suck blood from it because it smells like your feet, <laughs> truthfully. And it's, it's almost the same range of bacteria that makes Limburger stink that makes, you know, feet a day old stink. And mosquitoes have evolved, some mosquito species have evolved a tendency to go for the ankles, find it by the smell of the feet, because your capillaries are very close to the surface. Your blood flow is very close to the surface in your ankles. And so it's an, and it's an advantage, an evolutionary advantage, to find people's ankles. So as I mentioned, they go back a long way. You know, we've, we've probably all seen Jurassic Park, seen the movies, and, we've, and we were mystified by that original thought that you could pull genes out of mosquitoes that were in amber and genes for dinosaurs out of the mosquitoes. And, you know, it, most of that is not possible, but it is certainly true that mosquitoes are found in amber, and the amber can be dated, and you can go back to a, you know, a period and say there were mosquitoes common in this area. This, whoops, that was quick. Go backwards. It doesn't want to go backwards. Go backwards with this. Oh, come on, don't do that. Escape. Now go back. There we go. All right. It jumped too fast. Uh, this is from a, a paper a few years back, and it shows that mosquitoes in the tertiary period, which is kind of the end, you know, after the dinosaurs a little bit, uh, but long before us, Again, probably 60 million years ago. This is a mosquito trapped in amber that's full of the protozoan, the type of protozoan that causes malaria. So these are actual um, eukaryotes, which means they have nuclei, and they are parasitic, sort of parasitic in the mosquito, but in the world today, uh, malaria, um, Plasmodium falciparum and the other plasmodium species that cause malaria are carried by mosquitoes and there's a stage of the life which you can actually see this organism with a microscope and here is uh, an example that goes back 60 million years. So the relationship between mosquitoes and organisms that cause disease are also, can also be very old and it is very evolved and that's a, a subject I'll come back to. So this is a also a fairly recent paper, 2010, that makes on the basis of molecular biology, so doing genome analyses from plasmodium, the malaria causing protozoan, from mosquitoes, from uh, gorillas, from human beings, it suggests that human malaria, which is still the number one killer in the world, it still kills about a million people a year. And you know, I, I, somewhere in one of my slides says, something about mosquitoes being the most dangerous animal on the planet. So ask a kid in school, and I've done this a lot of times, what's the most dangerous animal on the planet? Well, it's usually a snake or a shark. Sometimes it's a lion. But, you know, they may kill a few hundred people a year in the whole world. Mosquitoes kill millions of people a year, and they are, by definition, the most dangerous animal on planet. Oh, there we go. Most dangerous animal on planet Earth. So these are some of the diseases that are, that are carried by mosquitoes. These are, these are some disease organisms that have evolved in a relationship with mosquitoes that allow them to be vectored. The word that we use in this, this area of science is vectored. And you remember that from physics. It means directionality. But it means that the organism can go from sick person A to sick person B 
by virtue of some interim period in the mosquito. And so these are, most of these you recognize, malaria, filariasis, elephantitis. This is a worm. This is a protozoan. These organisms have, again, a relationship that allow them to get into a mosquito from a bite on a human being or another animal and survive life in the mosquito and eventually get back out in a, in a subsequent bite. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. These are arboviruses. This is almost an acronym. It just stands for arthropod-borne virus. That's what arbovirus means. And they come in different flavors and different families based on their genetics. But you recognize all of these. Zika is sort of the one that's most topical right now. But dengue and chikungunya have had their moment in the sun. They're still out there. These eastern equina encephalitis is endemic. It will always pop up a little bit every year. And there are, there are others. Yellow fever killed a bunch of people here uh, back in the 1800s. And I'll show you a little bit about that. West Nile virus. We remember that one because it came into New Jersey and within two years. It was in the entire country. It's in almost every state. It's endemic now. It's always around. Every mosquito control, every health department in the country pays attention to how many cases they're seeing. And there is sort of a, a plateau, but it's not going to go away. That one was so rapidly spread because it also has a zoonotic cycle which means it also can be carried by an animal, and in this case, birds, and birds are migratory. And so the virus was rapidly spread across the country by virtue of birds moving around. So this, let me get oh, all the pieces up here. I do want to say, and at the end, I will acknowledge people who have provided me with some of these slides. Some of them are in the audience tonight, uh, and I will mention them by name. I didn't make up all of these slides. I've kind of pulled these together from various resources. Um, but this, this strikes a, a note on that evolved relationship issue. So here's a female mosquito. She bit somebody. She sucked up some blood. The blood had, in this case, we're talking about, I think, dengue virus. It had a virus in it. Well, for that virus to then be transmitted subsequently to another host, another human being, that virus has to go through the mouth, through the stomach, through the, the digestive system. It has to get out of the digestive system. So what it has to, in this case, it actually infects. So this is a micrograph of the epithelial cells of the stomach lining that have been infected with the dengue virus. They have to replicate in the, the, the epithelial cells and then escape from the epithelium into the blood. So a mosquito has what is called an open circulatory system. So every cell is bathed on its basal side by blood that moves around. And so this, this virus has to get into the stomach, infect the cells, get out of the cells, into the blood, and then find its way back to the salivary glands. And then it has to infect or invade the salivary gland cells so it ends up in the saliva. So that when that mosquito then bites somebody, Subsequently, it can transmit the virus. If those steps don't happen, it can't infect anybody. It also has to be an evolved relationship because it can't kill the mosquito. If the mosquito is infected with dengue and the, and the mosquito dies because of the infection, it's it. It stops right there. So there has to be a relationship evolved that covers all of those barriers, getting from the blood to the stomach, to the blood again, to the salivary glands, and it has to do that without reducing what we call the fitness of the mosquito so dramatically that the mosquito doesn't successfully bite another person, lay eggs and bite another person. So with all of the disease pathogens that are transferred by mosquitoes, some kind of evolved relationship like this had to come about. You cannot get HIV from a mosquito bite because there is not an evolved relationship between that virus and mosquitoes. When a, a mosquito bites someone with HIV, even if they're in a, a viremic phase and there's virus in their blood, it is not going to get past the stomach. And so it won't get to you. So this is a complicated set of things, but really fascinating. And it's, and, you know, it's a real study in survival of the fittest, Darwinian selection. In this case, Darwinian selection of the diseased organisms in a hostile environment, which is a mosquito. But there are a lot of 
selective pressures involved in all of the traits of the mosquito as well as all of the traits of the, um, mm -hmm, of the disease organism. Now I'm going to show you something about evolution because I want to, I want to drive home the, the power of evolution. So I'm going to, tr hopefully this is going to be easy. Um, I want to show you a YouTube and it's about evolution. It's from a lab at Harvard. And please still be there. <laughs> Hooray! And so this is bacterial evolution. We're all familiar with the fact that antibiotics are losing ground. So antibiotics fail almost daily. And they're always looking for new antibiotics because the bacteria are evolving resistance to these antibiotics. They're being selected for resistance by overuse. I mean, you almost can't go to a doctor and get penicillin anymore because they, they, they just can't afford to proliferate the resistant, the penicillin resistant bacteria out there. So that there's always new ones coming out. So this is a, a bacterial evolution YouTube. Please run. Hello. I clicked you. Oh, come on. Do it. Do it. Ah, aha, ta-da. All right, listen up. So what we ended up building was basically a Petri dish except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands, and at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal Petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally, the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, pour some thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic, up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads, until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. There we go. Okay. Now, back to the PowerPoint and back to the little icon. Okay, so that, that is, to me, that is a very dramatic demonstration of the fact that evolution is going on always. Always going on. Look around you. You know, we've, we've sequenced a number of human genomes, quite a few actually, but look around you. You don't all look the same. And that variation is all because in a large pool of organisms, there's a lot of genetic variation at all kinds of loci in your genome. It's, what, we're 15,000 genes or something? And in this room, we might have slight differences in thousands of those genes or all of those genes. That gives rise to human diversity, which is great, but it also gives, gives you the opportunity to submit yourself to selective pressures and win the battle over somebody else. And that's a big problem with mosquitoes. This is a, an example, or this is a sort of a diagrammatic representation of what's going on in that selective process. One of the big problems that mosquito control has these days is by virtue of the fact that the number of insecticides that are available for controlling mosquitoes is actually very small. And it is very small. There are different names and different formulations where they combine them with this and combine them with that. But I'll show you a list. And there's very few targets in the mosquito that are actually hit by these insecticides. And if there's a mutation in that one target, 
then all of a sudden, it's possible that the, the susceptibility of that mosquito, that population of mosquitoes, gets lost, and so that your pesticide no longer has any real value. In the case of bacteria, what is going on here is that you've got a big population, and mosquitoes, there's a hell of a lot more mosquitoes on planet Earth than there are human beings. And so there's a lot of genetic diversity, and in that genetic diversity, there could be, and we have certainly seen that there are ones that have mutations in those key genetic elements that we target with the pesticides, so that when you hit it with a pesticide, you kill everybody but that one. And then that one does its merry thing, it replicates, and before long you have a homogeneous population of resistant organisms. The same is, is true, and it's going on with mosquitoes uh, a lot. And it is a, a, a very big challenge to try to figure out what they call integrated mosquito management so that you're not doing that. You're not using the same hammer over and over again until that hammer becomes a glove and it doesn't work anymore. And there are different types of mosquito control agents. Larval control is, can be very effective if you can find the larvae, if you know where they are, if you know the bodies of water that they're in and you can actually isolate them. There are really good control methods for doing larval control. Some are hormonal that actually stop the larvae from developing into the next stage. Some are biological that have to do with, in some cases, how the gut works and how the pH in the gut functions. And if you saw me do this eight years ago, the last time I did this, that's what I talked about. Um, and then there are other chemical ways to kill mosquitoes as well. Adult control uh, comes in, uh, again, a lot of different shapes and forms. Bed nets are being used very extensively. And these are bed nets that have um, pesticides impregnated in the actual net, the ITN. Um, indoor spraying is working very well in some cases. Adulticiding by the methods that you're already familiar with, trucks, foggers, airplanes, helicopters. Um, they work when the circumstances are right for them. This is a, a new methodology that I'll talk about. A, a attractive toxic sugar baits, and I'll explain that. And then here is the one that a lot of people want to hear about, and that's genetically modified mosquitoes. We're trying to change the dynamics of the mosquito population so that they either can't carry disease anymore or we knock them out. Now it is true, and I get this question a lot, well, what would happen to the world if we killed all the mosquitoes? Nobody wants to do that. Nobody really wants to do that. Biology is a, is a question of balance, so say the Moody Blues. And it is, it, it is a balance between all of the organisms at any given time. And I don't think anybody with an enlightened mind thinks it's a good idea to completely wipe out mosquitoes. And I don't know if we could do it anyway, because they're extremely flexible, they move from space to space, and they come and they go at their own will. But if we could come up with me methods to bring their numbers down enough so that you can cure that reservoir of disease that you represent, then it doesn't matter what their numbers are. They're a nuisance, but they can't transmit disease if there's no pool of disease around. So all of the strategies that we're using are aimed at trying to control the numbers, both from a disease perspective and in the state of Florida and other subtropical areas, because they're just a pain. I mean, they're a nuisance. Who wants to go outside? I mean, how did the Native Americans live here before mosquito? I don't know, but they did somehow. But I wouldn't want to have to do that. One of the big issues in Africa with malaria is that most of the housing doesn't have windows with screens. And so you can't control what we do easily here by the, you know, the quality of our housing. You just keep them out until you cure that reservoir of sick human beings and then it's not a big problem anymore. So a lot of the, the money that's going into trying to resolve the issues with malaria in the developing parts of the world always include how can we improve their housing. Anyway, so here's a, a list of, whoops, did it again, of common pesticides, and, there's, and then what they actually do. So you've heard names by, like malathion before, and methoprene, and permethrin, and DDT, and BTI. You've heard those names before, and you've wondered, what, what the heck do they actually do? 
Well, this one, this group up here, the organophosphates that, that uh, a lot of people have a lot of problem with, they're afraid of, they inactivate acetylcholinesterase, which is part of the nerve muscle communication system. And without inactivating or without active acetylcholinesterase, your muscles go like that and the mosquitoes will die. Um, and it is true that these toxins in high dosage can affect pretty much any animal on the planet. But it, the dosage difference between what affects a mosquito and what affects even a butterfly is actually, uh, can be quite different. Methoprene um, is a hormone mimetic so that it mimics juvenile hormone which is necessary for larval mosquitoes to become adults. And so if you feed them a lot, uh, if you feed them um, methoprene, well actually it's the other way around. It, juvenile hormone keeps them from metamorphosing and then it's ecdysone which actually makes them metamorphose. But if you give them a lot of the juvenile hormone mimetic, they get stuck and they stay juvenile forever. And this is very effective. Uh, and it's a lot of insects can be sensitive to that. Permethrin blocks the sodium channels open. DDT blocks sodium channels open. And then this bacterial toxin, BTI, which is one you can buy at Walmart, um, it works on the gut, and pH of the gut, and lyses the cells. And this is kind of the list. I mean, there are some other more esoteric things out there, but this is kind of the list. And the problem with this list is it's short. It's relatively short. The targets are short. And when you put acetylcholine esterase, the gene for that under pressure, you can select for one that's resistant to this. And the same is too with the sodium channels that both of these classes of pesticides work on. You can select from this huge population that one individual or that those two individuals who are not as sensitive to this. And that is emerging all over the world and all over the state of Florida. This is one example. This is a, what's called the CDC bio, bottle assay, bottle bioassay. And it's the sort of standard method that the people in mosquito control use to assess the sensitivity of a population of mosquitoes. So you go out and you catch a bunch of mosquitoes, you bring them into the laboratory, and Daniel Dixon back there who does this for a living can tell you how you do that. You bring them into the, the, the laboratory and then there is a standard protocol that has been used uh, and published by the CDC of how you then assess their sensitivity to whatever pesticide it is or whatever class of pesticides you're interested in. And you set up this assay, you put your mosquitoes in there and then you count off time and you see how many die and how fast they die. And so this, this purplish line here is kind of what you what we would have expected 100 years ago. And this is a, a bred in the laboratory strain of mosquitoes that are sort of the benchmark for what should happen. And with the standard assay for, in this case, deltamethrin, under these conditions, at 30 minutes, they should all be dead, or darn near all dead. Well, here are three populations from various parts of the state. Well, this is, this is actually a, a resistant line. No, this is the resistant line, the green. And it's, you know, at 30 minutes, 55% uh, dead. But here's a population from down in Miami, Little River area of down in Miami. 30 minutes, almost none of them are dead. So the emergence of resistance has really hit the headlines and it has really hit the mosquito control districts in the face because it is, it seems to always be getting worse. There is a very, a uh, dedicated effort, Roxanne Conley at the University of Florida is part of a team that is trying to assess this for a number of mosquito species around the state of Florida. This is just a little bit of that data and it shows places where resistance to both organophosphates and pyrethroids happen, happen at the same place like St. John's County, like I guess not Flagler County, but probably. Um, pyrethroid resistance alone, organophosphate, et cetera, et cetera. And these are, this is very incomplete. There is data for a lot more places around the state of Florida. The long and the short of it is we are putting them under the same kind of pressure 
that we put bacteria under when we overuse an antibiotic. And so these emergent populations are resistant to this. So we, you know, we need to find out better ways to deal with them, and I will come back to that. So now let's change to the subject that probably brought half of you here, and that is what's the status of Zika? And what, what is this? What's going on here? Where did it come from? Well, Zika is a, an arbovirus. It was discovered a long time ago, 1947 in Africa. And since 1947, there have been very few cases of human infection. Some primates, a little bit here, a little bit there. But about, I guess, six, seven years ago, it started popping up in some Pacific Islands in sort of more epidemic status. And then a few years ago, it showed up in South America and all of the, a lot of the islands of the Caribbean, and it has caused a great deal of hardship and a great deal of scientific effort to figure out what we can do about it. Because one of the things that it does, one of the things we have pretty well confirmed that it does, is it affects our babies. And you know, we're not, we're not cool with that. We, that is, I mean, if you're gonna, you're gonna set up a rallying cry from the masses, mess around with people's babies. And the Zika virus does, in fact, do that. It is a, what is called a neurotropic virus, which means it has, for some reason, it ends up infecting and affecting nervous tissue more than other tissues. And in a uh, early term baby, it affects the ongoing development, replication of brain cells, so that it kills some of those cells so that they don't replicate anymore and you end up with this uh, microcephaly, a small head, and a baby that is never going to be like a normal baby. It's never going to probably never learn to speak, never learn a lot of the, the normal functions, uh, and will have to be cared for for its entire life. And we don't really know yet what entire life means because it's such a new problem. We just don't have that kind of data. So here's a nice summary slide of what the, the current opinion is about what happens with a Zika infection. So here are roots of infection. So we know about the mosquito infection. Again, infected person gets bitten. The virus survives through the biology of the mosquito, gets into the salivary glands, and ends up in the second person if that mosquito bites a second time. There's also a strong evidence that it can be sexually transmitted. Transfusions, of course, the virus can live for a fairly extended period of time in blood if the blood is kept warm. And then there are some hints to other possible ways or ways that we can't, infections that we can't track to these three. The infection in an adult uh, can be can manifest in a number of different ways. You get a fever, you can get conjunctivitis, you get a rash, you can also get sore joints, but 80% of the time you get nothing. And you can be, you can have a high viremic load, you're making virus, and you don't know it because there's really no manifestation in a lot of people. But you're still a carrier and you can still be the source of a subsequent infection in, in you know, worst case scenario in an early pregnancy mom. During the first trimester, these gross anomalies can happen. Later on, not as likely, um, and we really don't know what happens later in life for kids that are infected in utero. We just don't, it's just too new. We just don't have all the data, but we do know some of the, the ways to track it. And in the parts of the world where this is really a big issue, Central America, South America, and in Florida, um, we do a very, we meaning the community, does a, a great job of trying to, to track it. So in the state of Florida, this is kind of a, some highlights of uh, the highlights of Zika coming to the United States. And here's when it was declared by the World Health Organization to be a, a, an issue, uh, uh, something to, uh, panic about. It was, emer it was declared an emergency in the state of Florida later in the same year by Governor Scott. And funds, you know, kind of like FEMA funds, they kind of get there someday to, to help with monitoring, diagnosis, and mosquito control, which are really the best things you can do. 
This is a summary of where we have been and where we are at the moment. As was true with West Nile virus and dengue and chikungunya, there, there seems to be um, an early you know, mushroom cloud phase that's followed by a settling down phase. And so when something like West Nile virus becomes endemic, the numbers get lower, stay fairly consistent. Why that happens, um, you can speculate. It could be that mosquito control is, is doing the necessary job. It could be that the population is becoming immune, is uh, developing an immunity to whatever that creature, whatever that um, virus is. Uh, it could be a lot of things, but that tends to be a, a big burst and then things settle down. And in the United States with Zika, in 2016, we had over 1,000 cases that were counted, and, and remember, 80% of the cases are non-symptomatic, so that's probably 20, 25% of really what was going on. Um, there were some locally acquired, you know, down in the Miami area, you've certainly read the news about there actually being local transmission, not just travel-related. So at first, we thought and hoped that it would be just travel-related infections, that people would go to a Caribbean island or Brazil or somewhere that was heavily infected and would come back with it, and that would be the source. But we had local transmission in um, Windermere, or well, I can't remember the name of it, a suburb of Miami, for uh, several months. And so there were about 285 cases that were actually locally acquired, the ones we don't know about, the number of pregnant women, etc. This year, and we're almost to the end of this year, this is as, as of October 12th, the numbers have gone up just a little bit, uh, but the numbers are down, you know, almost tenfold in some cases from that, but they're still out there. It's still happening out there, and it still can happen out there. The stats are summarized here, nine poor pregnancies in the United States, uh, two Zika-associated um, Guillain-Barre syndrome infection. So there's another manifestation of the infection of this neurotropic virus in, in adults, which is called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is kind of an autoimmune disease in which your immune system attacks where a virus is being produced and, and tears it up. And in, in the case of Guillain-Barre syndrome, people lose muscle control and they frequently lose control of their legs that's permanent, and you don't get over it. There are other sources of, of that kind of autoimmune, but the, the data that connects uh, Zika with uh, GBS is pretty strong. Uh, pretty, it's correlative, but it's pretty strong. There's no way yet to really do a, a direct pathological uh, patterning of what happens in, in GBS with Zika. Hospitalizations, pregnant women, births have occurred. And then this is from the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and the, the Health Department. And there are some things that they can't tell you for OSHA reasons. You know, so this, this is part of the data, but there are other things that are being watched carefully, uh, as careful as can be. Okay, so now let's, we're gonna, that's sort of the status of Zika. I, I don't think we're anticipating a big uh, epidemic of it uh, coming to the United States, but we don't know enough to be able to say that with assurance. So the best thing you can do is to try to control the vector of the disease in your environment. And so Daniel Dixon back there, who was uh, my very last graduate student ever, and who works for the Anastasia Mosquito Control District now, was part of a project to try to control the local vector in downtown St. Augustine. So it turns out that Aedes aegypti, which is also known as the yellow fever mosquito because it killed a bunch of people back in the late 1800s. There's a, there's a cemetery downtown St. Augustine that you can tour that's full of uh, people who died from yellow fever. Yellow fever is not a big worldwide problem anymore, but the, the reemergence of it is something that's always on the radar. Um, there's a very good vaccine for yellow fever. There are no vaccines yet for Zika or dengue or chikungunya, um, but people are trying. But for yellow fever, there's a very good, and I've had it, 
and I've never had yellow fever, so pff, uh, must, must work, huh, right? Anyway, but the yellow fever mosquito used to be really common in St. Augustine up until I think the mid-90s, correct me if I'm wrong, um, about the mid-90s, and then they started to disappear. We were invaded by what is called the Asian tiger mosquito, which is a, a closely related uh, Aedes species, Aedes albopictus, and for some reason, and nobody's ever been able to answer this question for me, and I've asked a lot of people, you know, how this happened, but they, they kind of replaced the population of Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti just stopped, slowly stopped showing up in all of the monitoring track, traps that the mosquito control districts do to keep track of what's going on. And they almost completely disappeared in all of our county. And then a couple years ago, they started coming back. And they're back. And this is another, from my perspective, this is another example of evolution. Whatever the evolutionary battle that was going on between Aedes albopictus in Aedes aegypti, that aegypti was losing, a population of these mosquitoes have now emerged that they're winning. And so they're replacing, in certain areas, Aedes albopictus. And they're back, and they're particularly back in downtown St. Augustine, of all the places. Oh, this. these are pictures of diagrams of the viruses. So where do you find Aedes aegypti? Well, these Aedes aegypti and albopictus are both container breeders. They like, they will breed in a thimble of water. And if the water doesn't dry up, they'll hatch in there. Or if the water dries up and comes back, they'll hatch in there. Their eggs can last a really long time. I just hatched some Aedes aegypti last week. That The, the eggs came to me from the Department of Agriculture in Florida and in Gainesville in April. And they hatch like crazy. So they're, they're very, this species, very resistant to being just hanging around and waiting for their opportunity to get into a, a, an aquatic environment and hatch. But they, they like all kinds of icky water. This is actually what's called an overtrap. And so the eggs, this is for the purpose of monitoring how many mosquitoes are laying eggs. And so that's, that's kind of contrived. But all these places with standing water are dangerous. Uh, they're dangerous and they are there are more than you can imagine, especially in downtown St. Augustine, in the old parts of downtown St. Augustine, where there's brick walls 200 years old and wells and this and that, you know, and it sits there and it rained like crazy this summer. There was water always around. I mean, this, this case here, this is an upturned uh, recycling bin and just these little crevices here hold enough water to breed the dickens out of mosquitoes. And then, of course, in America's oldest city, there are these places that are, you really can't get into, but mosquitoes can get in there. And then all over this part of Florida, people love to decorate with vermiliads because they're tough plants. They'll, they'll withstand you know, a light freeze in the winter and, they, and you don't need to do anything to them and they'll flower and they're pretty, but they hold water and they hold water in thousands upon thousands of little bitty vesicles that are just vessels that are just big enough to breed oh, a few thousand mosquitoes at a time, or certainly several hundred. And so the Anastasia Mosquito Control District did a, a two-year project to, first of all, try to get into every yard that they could into, every backyard that they could. And Daniel will tell you that he almost got shot a few times. Um, people aren't real fond of you coming into their backyard, you know? And, you know, even with the explanation that, you know, you're going to die because Zika is here, you know, whatever, you know, they still, they have their reasons for keeping their privacy private. And, and so the difficulty of doing a saturation evaluation is in itself very tough. And then when you come back and you say, well, you've got all of these things in your yard that are just full of stagnant water and dip it out. See that? That's 150 mosquitoes. Getting people to do the simplest thing, which is dump or cover, is very hard to do. But I encourage you, anywhere you've got the potential of standing water, dump it at least once a week, 
or keep it covered all the time. Remember that. Dump and cover. Dump and cover. Dump and cover. It's easy. You can do that. Uh, then they, they, you know, once they had done this attempt at sort of a saturation diagnosis of the uh, festering poison <laughs> of the mosquito larval uh, maintenance capacity in downtown St. Augustine, then they actually went after it with, with handheld foggers, truck foggers, tried to get to it, and the results were disappointing, but you know, we'll keep trying. But I encourage you to take one less at home, dump and cover. Because, you know, they're biting you in your backyard. Mosquitoes don't fly very far. You know, mosquitoes maybe 300 yards, or 100 yards, rather. Wind can carry them farther than that. But typically, they don't travel very far from your backyard to somebody else's backyard, maybe that far. If you keep your environment clean, it's going to help. But the long and the short of it, because of that, what I mentioned before, the fact that pesticides are losing their efficacy because we're selecting for resistant mosquitoes, there, are, there is the need for alternate strategies, for novel ways of controlling mosquitoes that aren't strictly based on the use of pesticide toxins. And, and we all know that pesticides are dangerous and if not used properly, and I will tell you personally, as the environmentalist or one of the environmentalists on the Florida Coordinating Council, I am saturated, or I am satisfied rather, that the mosquito control districts do a really good job of minimizing damage. You can't make zero happen, but you can do a, a and we watch carefully, and they do a good job. Um, but you can't, can never be quite perfect. So there are, there are other, strategies that are being developed, and they include, and are not limited to this list here. There's something I'll say a little bit more about the sterile insect technique, um, the use of transgenic mosquitoes, a couple of different formats. There's another kind of way of making mosquitoes um, incompatible in terms of breeding, which uses a bacteria that lives inside its cells. There's this, what I mentioned before, this attracts, attractive toxic sugar bait methodology. And then there's a, a new methodology which, has, which asks the female mosquito to pick up some toxin that will keep your larvae from developing and, and move it to the next place you lay eggs and put it there. Auto dissemination is the phrase for that. The sterile insect technique has been around a long time. It was used effectively in the United States to get rid of, of screw worm which is uh, a blowfly, a certain kind of blowfly larvae. And back in the, the 50s, screw worm was in lots of the southern parts of the United States. People would fly, lays an egg on a wound, and then, you know, a week later, you got a hole under your skin where this worm, this screw worm, has screwed its way in and starts eating your tissues. But using the sterile insect technique, which is basically... You breed a bunch of these flies, and then you sterilize all the males. And the way you sterilize all the males is, I think, the way that they did it. You can do it chemically, and you can do it with radiation, and then you release just the males into the wild population. So when they mate, the female only mates one time. She mates with a sterile guy. She's not going to lay any eggs. And they pretty much eliminated the, the screw worm by that technique. Well, that technique is being explored again for mosquitoes. In fact, there's a, there was a big grant um, awarded this year from the state for the purpose of raising up mosquitoes, sterilizing with x-rays the males, and then releasing the males. And there are certain areas that have been chosen as test places to do this. And, and that should then bring that population down. It won't stop it completely. You can't do that because, the, you know, they're still going to be blown in from the wind from here and there. But the sterile male, male technique is, is about to happen. Um, and I think, Daniel, are they going to test some here in St. John's County? Uh, yes. yes. Never mind. There we go. I mean, yes, thank you. Yes, they are. But there are a number of places around the state where they're going to do that. Um, there are other forms of the sterile insect technique. This is, oh no, this is, uh, that's the next slide. It's very environmentally friendly. There's no toxins. 
Mosquitoes that are sterilized this way are not radioactive. They are not radioactive. They simply have their DNA kind of jumbled by the x-rays. And, and if you can separate the males from the females in your population that you're breeding in some big greenhouse, um, then you can release the males. It's hard to do. Re separating males and females is not the easiest thing in the world to do. It's usually done at the larval stage. Um, and the effectiveness of that really defines how well this method will be received. Because if you're releasing, even if they're sterile, a whole bunch more females that are going to go out and bite people, you know, it's not going to go over very well. But there are technologies being pursued that, that should be able to do that. There are other ways. The irradiated male is what we were just talking about. Oxitec is a company out of Britain that has engineered some Aedes aegypti that carry a gene that when the male carrying this gene mates with a wild female, she doesn't have any effective uh, offspring. And there has been a, ever since the dengue outbreak in, in uh, Key West four years ago, maybe four, maybe five, um, there has been a back and forth battle over getting this permitted a test of this permitted in Florida. There are other parts in the world where it is used uh, on a, a, a fairly successful basis. It does kind of depend on being able to, to corral your, your, your population. So an island is a great place to do this because your, your population of mosquitoes is corralled on that island. And it has been very effective on certain island locations. Um, this is a company out of Kentucky that uses a bacteria that exists in a lot of different genetic forms and a lot of different kinds of insects, but it so happens that if mosquito A is infected with Wolbachia A and it breeds with mosquito B that is either not infected at all or infected with a different Wolbachia, they don't have uh, uh, offspring, uh, fertile. You don't get any offspring from that. So this is another method that it's on the list, trying to go through all of the steps in the legislature and the local government to get permission to give this a try. Again, it's sort of a regionalized kind of thing. Okay, we're about out of time. I do want to say something about attractive toxic sugar baits. Well, one of the things that you probably don't think about very much is that most of the energy a female mosquito uses in her life is not from blood. The blood is used primarily for the purpose of making eggs. And so when she's not in the mood to make eggs or she's not biologically ready to make eggs or she just made eggs, she still has to fly. And so she still has to eat. And most of what they eat, it's something like 80 to 90% of the biological energy that a mosquito, female mosquito ever uses in their life comes from plant nectar, plant juices, plant sugar. So they're sugar feeders. And 10, 15 years ago, a number of researchers around the world said, well, you know, maybe that's a way to get them. Get them at that stage when they're sugar feeding them. Feed them on sugar that has some kind of a, a toxin and knock down the populations with that. And then it also turns out that mosquitoes find their sugar sources by virtue of their chemical senses and maybe visual cues, but certainly chemical senses. So they're, they are attracted to certain plants more than other plants, like they're attracted to certain people's feet more than other people's feet. And so there's been a combinatorial effort to put together what attracts a mosquito to a sugar source and then putting in an artificial sugar source, such as these green spots on this leaf right here, some kind of a fairly safe, a very safe toxin that will knock them down. And this is, has been tested a number of different times. and as part of IMM, Integrated Mosquito Management, it has a place and an effectiveness. This last method I'll talk about is this auto-dissemination, which I think is very cute. Not cute, but clever. And, and if you lace a, an oviposition trap, and here, this is the red bucket here, with one of those hormonal mimetics that stops larvae from developing, so that when a female comes in here and lays eggs, she gets this on her feet. Then she goes off to lay eggs a second time somewhere else, and she 
lets it, I mean, it comes off of her feet into the, aqua, uh, the aquatic environment. So logically, it sounds good. It's, it's a little more difficult to get it to be broadly effective, but it's being investigated by a lot of people in a number of different places. It's called auto-dissemination, and it's basically let the female do the work and kill everybody and uh, prevent the next generation. There are always problems with doing any kind of mosquito control, problems from public perspective, perspective problems from funding, problems, you know, real problems because the mosquito control is damaging some part of the environment, on and on and on. It's, it's difficult. Another lesson I would say, or I would want to impart on you, another thing to learn today to make your life absolutely happy because you learned something, is that there's lots of information out there that will satisfy your curiosity about how this goes. So you can visit the Mosquito Control District websites for wherever you live, or you can vis visit uh, the Florida Mosquito Control Association, FMCA, their website, and you can learn details about all of this, uh, and you can lose your panic when the helicopter goes over your head. Or not. But be informed. So two things, dump and cover, be informed. And, and then, of course, we had the wettest summer I've ever seen in my life <laughs> here in this part of the Florida with the hurricane and then uh, Northeaster right behind it. And the, the, the land got saturated with water and it sat and it sat and it's still sitting in a lot of places. That is mosquito breeding country. This has been from the director of the Mosquito Control District in, in St. John's County, uh, Dr. Rudy Shu been the worst year he's seen. So it's been a very hard year to control mosquito populations because of how wet it's been. Irma was part of the problem, but there's a lot of things going on. But again, if you're informed and you dump and cover, you can help your own little microcosm. I'll skip that one. I do want to acknowledge people who generously provided me with uh, the slides that I showed you tonight. Daniel Dixon, who's sitting back there, Christopher Bibbs, Rudy Zhu, all from Anastasia Mosquito Control District. Carolyn S. F. Statheon, who is from the Florida Department of Agriculture um, and Consumer Services, and she is our regional outreach person, the person to talk to uh, if you have problems or questions. And then uh, Dr. Roel Denglossen, who is at the University of Florida in the Emerging Pathogens Institute over there and is actually the director of the Center for Excellence, Center of Excellence for the Southeast region of the United States. And with that, I quit. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>